Hey everybody, welcome back to another Small Soldier video. And a video I've been wanting to make for you guys for some time now. I'll show you the techniques I used for painting this Life Miniatures 1 tenth scale Rommel bust. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy and getting lots of modeling done. And really, as model makers, it's not something that's hard for us to do. Alright, I'll uh, shut up now and let's get on with that presentation. Okay, so the first thing we'll take a look at are the oil paints I'll be using to paint the flesh on the uh, Rommel bust. And as you can see, they're all Windsor Newton paints for the most part. I do have a couple others here, and you'll see one is Old Holland Golden Baroque and some M. Graham paints. The only difference being the M. Graham paints have walnut oil as a binder as opposed to linseed oil. And for mixing the paint, I'll use this metal palette knife and some odorless thinner for, of course, thinning the paint. Another product I'll be using will be Liquin, and it can be used for thinning the paint and also acts as a drying agent. And here you can see I've put the oils out on a piece of cardboard just to wick away any of the linseed oil and this will help give the oil paint a matte finish. I give the oils about 20 minutes to wick off on the cardboard and then I transfer them to my white tile palette and here you can see the colors I'll be using as the base mix for the figure. And the first color is yellow ochre, then roughly the same amount of terra rosa, Then just a small amount of cobalt blue. Just start with a little bit and work your way up if you need more. If you had too much cobalt blue at the beginning, it could start going a little too purpley on you and you probably want to keep it more to the reddish tones than the purple. Next I'll add some white to that base flesh tone and this will be the start of my base flesh tone and I'll work out my highlights and shadows from this color here and you will see on this portion the mixing of all the highlights I unfortunately didn't film the mixing of the shadows but you'll get the idea of a progressive uh, lightning and you would do the same for darkening with uh, cobalt blue and uh, some of the terra rosa for the shadows the other colors on the palette I'll be using as the face progresses, but uh, not for the very beginning here. These are just the basic flesh tones. Okay, you can see we have our pre-shaded face here from the previous video. And you can see how that pre-shading really helps establish where the shadows and the highlights are going to end up on this figure. Here I'm laying in some basic shadow tones in those shadowed areas. You have to start somewhere and I always like to start with the shadows. For me the shadows represent the character of the figure and gives me direction for the next steps to come. In this first step I do most of my blending with the single brush there's no real need to do any major blending at this point as it's the only color on the face so far so you're not going to get any big muddy areas by blending too many colors together. You've probably noticed that I've written a lot of the colors on the palette itself with permanent marker. The reason I do this is not so much for the obvious colors but some of the colors the browns and the blacks can start looking the same on the palette so I just like to have that there so I can distinguish between what I'm pulling from what pile and it helps this old brain from getting too confused. Okay now that I've got some tone to the face I go in with my first shadow color 
and you can see it's a reddish orangish type tone and I'm just going into pretty much all those same areas I was just into before but you'll notice later I come in with a shader brush to blend all these colors together So what you see me mixing off camera is a little bit of the shadow color that I'm using with liquid and the liquid acts as a thinner to make the paint a little more transparent and also helps to speed up the dry time in between so I don't have to wait so many days for the oils to dry. When I'm blending this first layer of shadow color, I'm basically giving a poking, stippling motion to the brush and blending it into the surrounding areas, feathering out those hard edges so that I get a nice soft transition between the color I had down there before and what I'm putting on top now. Okay, now that everything is nicely blended, I'm going to go in and show you the second shadow color. And looky here, I actually show you what type of brush I'm using this time. As you can see, I'm being a little more precise where I'm placing these shadow colors this time. And you'll see me getting more precise with the placement of these shadows and highlights as the figure progresses. Don't forget to add liquid or some type of thinning medium to your oil paints. You want them to stay nice and thin. You just want thin skins of paint. You don't want to have a big buildup of layers of uh, heavy paint. The best way to achieve smooth blends with your oils is definitely to get those paints down to a thin viscosity. This is the best way to achieve nice results. The beauty of oil paints is the fact that they are so translucent. Especially for skin tones, you get to see all those layers of color shining through and you can achieve an amazing amount of depth as well. The third shadow color will be placed in areas like under the jawline, bottom of the chin, bottom of the lip, under the nose, under the brow of the eyes in the areas where most extreme shadows fall. And again by having the post shading there before I started painting the figure this gives me a road map of exactly where to put those shadows. Always remember to blend after each application of paint if you leave it too long and it dries you'll end up with a harsh line and you'll have to go back in later and fix those areas so if you're working away and something takes you away from the table and you're distracted I mean all is not lost you can always fix that problem but it's just easier to blend it out while the paint is still wet once the initial highlights and shadows have dried for a while I like to go back in with the Golden Baroque color by Old Holland. I use this color a lot in the final stages of figure painting. I feel it gives the figure more life and helps to accentuate all those steps you did previously. I should mention that there are substantial dry times in between each one of these layers. I do however have a crock pot which is essentially a small oven. About 20 minutes on low will be enough to dry everything up enough so I can continue on with the process. This step here I find is uh, quite a crucial one for me. 
Once the figure is all dried up, I'll go over the whole figure with a very thin layer of odorless thinner and then add a layer of golden baroque over the entire figure. Essentially a wash is what I'm creating here and once I get it all over the entire areas that I want to cover, I'll go back in with a dry brush cleaning up any pooled areas so I don't end up with tide marks. After cooking off the thinner and he's dry again, I go back in with that same golden brew color, creating more red tones in the shadows. Here you can see I'm being a lot more precise where I'm adding those red tones. I'm trying to create a more intense shadow in certain areas. You may have also noticed that I don't do a lot of wet in wet blending as far as highlights and shadows go. I found that by adding highlights and shadows and trying to blend them at the same time, the paint started to get a little heavy and murky and muddy looking and all the colors would just get blended away. I do do a little bit of wet and wet blending but those would be colors that are similar like just the dark areas will be wet and wet blended and the light areas will be wet and wet blended separately. I'm still using liquid as my thinning agent here which also helps to dry the paint. The only thing with liquid is, which isn't such a bad thing on a face, is it leaves a slight sheen. I do however use it on non-flesh areas from time to time and if I do do that I just get a good matte uh, finish to spray over the model to create a matte look on the clothing. So after several hours and layers of paint this is kinda where we're at. So now that everything has had time to dry again, I go back in with Golden Baruch mixed with some Terra Rosa. The paint is a little less transparent here as I want to emphasize the rosiness of the red here. And it tends to be more towards the reddish tones than the orangey tones. Another thing I haven't done a lot of up to this point is add too many highlights. I've been using the appreciated highlights as my guide for creating all these shadows. You'll see later on in the video that I go back in with highlights to just brighten up all the areas that may have gotten a little dark over this whole process. Another thing I should mention is your blending brush should be occasionally wiped off on a towel of some kind just to get the residue off so you're not continually moving that blended pigment back onto the figure. Here I'm adding the color indigo to the bearded area or trying to create a five o'clock shadow and I usually add that to the lower portions of the jaw, around the chin area and the upper lip. Indigo is the perfect color for this particular part as it has more of a bluish hue to it as opposed to using brown or black where things can get a little muddy looking.
And this pretty much completes the shadowed areas on our figure. Next, I'm going to uh, finish by punching out all the highlights with the uh, lighter tones. So again, the figure has had time to dry in between these shadow tones. And now I'm going in and essentially cherry picking where I want to put my highlights. They're all going to be put in specific places just to pop things forward. If you remember from previous videos uh, where I talk about light brings things forward, shadows push things back. So that's basically what I'm doing now. I'm trying to bring all the protruding parts forward so you really get that three-dimensional look. Unfortunately, I've either lost or can't find the footage of how I painted the eyes on this figure. Chances are, with uh, Alzheimer's setting in, I just totally forgot to film that part. So anyway, if you look in the upper right hand corner, I do have a video all about painting eyes. You can check that out and hopefully that makes up for this big dumbass error. And this will pretty much complete the face of Rommel. So let's go on to the cap next. Here's our appreciated cap. Now let's make this thing pop. In a previous video I mentioned that there are many shades of field gray so don't get too caught up on the color just mix it to your liking look at reference photos but as you'll see from the photograph that I'm gonna post up here right away there are lots and lots of different tones and shades of field gray these will be the shadow tones for the field gray cap And here we have the highlights being mixed up. If you're looking to mix up a field gray, this should give you a pretty good guideline on how to do it. But like I said earlier, there are so many different colors of field gray that really it's up to you the shade you want to go for. So just experiment and I'm sure you'll come up with something that works for you. Again the paint is very thin that I'm laying in here. It's a mix of liquid and thinner, more thinner than liquid because I don't want to get a sheen to the clothed areas. Don't forget to dry the paint in between layers if you can. Try not to do too much wet blending when you're getting to this stage. If you do that you could end up with quite thick areas of paint and you'll see brush marks. So by doing it 
nice and thin like this, you're always going to be ensured that you'll have nice smooth blended transitions. I thought the color was starting to get a little gray looking and I wanted it to be more in the greenish tone of field gray. So I went back in with some olive green and glazed that into the top of the hat here. So you'll notice that uh, it looks a little more greenish than gray. It's just what I was going for. It's not right or wrong like I said before. It's just uh, what I envisioned for the field gray I was trying to achieve. Masking fluid makes a great temporary glue for when you're mounting things to be painted and that's what the purple part there on the stick is. It's just uh, the masking fluid, once it's dried it creates that color. So if you're looking for a temporary glue for holding parts, try masking fluid. It works awesome. So if you're looking to use black for any reason, I would avoid using straight black out of a tube. You can make a really nice rich black out of using the primary colors if you mix them together. So you mix red, blue, green and a bit of yellow and maybe a touch of brown and you'll get a really deep, deep dark color which isn't black but emulates black. So try that the next time you go to mix your blacks up. Don't use black, create your own black. It's the best way to go. It, it makes things look a lot more lively. Black tends to kill things and make them look dull. I think you can agree that the pre-shade that I did before I even started doing any of the blending and the painting with oils really helps to create that road map and you can do the majority of all your shadowing before you even get to highlights just with the pre-shade that's on there. Remember when you're painting your miniature that there always has to be a light source and it has to be coming from somewhere, whether it's coming from up above or the left or right or the bottom. You want to be able to show that on your miniatures. So in this case, I'm doing sort of a 12 o'clock high kind of uh, lighting setup as if the sun was coming from the top. I think it would be kind of cool to do a figure with uh, light coming from the back or from the bottom or possibly a fire, a situation like that where you're getting very dynamic lighting happening. Yeah, I'll have to try that maybe on a figure here in the not too distant future. So this is what I was telling you about earlier, how to mix up a custom black. You can see me mixing in some Prussian blue, a little red, some uh, greens, and this is where I'll add this color on the cap here. And you can see it looks a lot like black, but it actually is more of a very dark bluish green brown. So it, I think it looks a lot richer than black and leaves your figure looking a little more bold and brilliant than uh, dull by using that black color.
Here you see me using an actual metallic paint. It's an acrylic metallic. Uh, you have to be careful with metallics when you're painting over finished areas just because you don't want the metallic flake to end up in your finished paint. That's why I kind of put this on a little earlier than I may have done in the past. Oh uh, yes, another tip for you when you're using metallics, don't use your good brushes that you're using for your regular paints. Have a separate bunch of brushes specifically for metallics because if you use those brushes that you use for metallics with your other colors, metallic paint always sits in the bristles no matter how good you clean it. And the same thing goes with your water that, or your enamel thinner, whatever you're using to clean the brush with. Keep that as a separate pot don't mix in your regular colors or you'll end up with shiny paint particles in your paint. Alright, so if you don't know what non-metallic metal painting is, basically it's taking an acrylic paint or an enamel paint, whatever your, your choice may be, and you're painting without metallic paints. You're, you're emulating metallic look, but you're using oils or acrylics to create that look. And that's basically what I'm doing here with the banding and the ribbon on the cap. That's all done with acrylic paint with oil washes of burnt umber. Now the key here to getting that non-metallic look from what I have figured out is to slowly build up thin transparent layers of successive lighter layers on top of the yellow ochre. Uh, then I go back and forth between light and dark, light and dark until I get just the right punch in that color and, and it starts looking more like metal than flat paint. I also do a lot of stippling with the brush that's just small tiny dots layered over top of each other so a little bit of dark here and then a little bit of light there and you just keep building that back and forth back and forth until I achieve the look I'm going for. Here's another area that I did non-metallic metal on, the epaulets on the shoulder boards. Same thing as what I did on the braiding on the hat. I just altered the tone slightly and made it look maybe a little more golden on this particular part. I don't use a lot of Games Workshop products, but I do like a couple of their metal colors and their flesh wash works out pretty good from time to time. There also seems to be a lot of companies coming out with uh, inks lately, and basically these Games Workshop washes are inks. And uh, they're a little more intense than a regular acrylic paint I find, and you can get some nice variation in tones. I'm not sure exactly what to say about this particular part. It really all comes down to having a steady hand, a really good brush, and the right consistency of paint. So my word of advice to you would be get a mini that you don't care too much about and just practice painting lines and designs and all sorts of different things where you need to have a steady hand and play with the consistency of your paint quite a bit and you'll find that uh, what 
flows off your brush easiest. And this way you'll gain a lot more control over what you're doing. Same goes for what I'm doing here. It's just a matter of consistency of paint and accuracy where you're putting the strokes and practice. Practice, practice, practice. You know the old saying. I find indigo to be a really good color to shade with for whites and light colors such as tans and um, this color here, the stencil that I'm using. It's got a natural blue tone to it which when you look at uh, anything in nature that's white or has a light tone to it, generally you'll see a uh, blue hue to the shadow. So indigo is my go-to color for that reason. I'd call this a filter more than a wash. The reason being, I'm just trying to uh, change the tone of the color underneath to more of a brown as opposed to a uh, greenish gray. That's basically what a filter is and what it does. You may have noticed that the scarf on this particular part is painted differently than what I just did in the previous segment. Uh, just disregard that, this was my first attempt at the scarf and I wasn't happy with it so I redid it. Just goes to show if you screw something up there's always a way to fix it. No need to panic and chuck the miniature out, which some might do. There's always a way to fix your mistakes. Again on the coat, like the rest of the figure, I add in all my shadows first, the three tones of uh, dark shadows, and then I work my way into the light. At this stage I'm working very thin, and it's mainly thinner as opposed to liquid here. I'm just laying in nice thin layers and blending them out and then going back over the same areas a few minutes later. Almost like working at like acrylics where I just keep going in and by the time I get to the next area and come back to the old it's dry and I can continue working. That's the uh, thinner working there for you. I also should mention that I do put clear coats in between coats. So if I stick it in my dryer for a few minutes and pull it out then uh, I'll add a layer of clear to it and that way it protects anything that was underneath and I can continue working without the fear of agitating previous layers. Thank you. 
I had mentioned in a previous video that you should look at the figure as being a series of cylinders, cones, and spheres. So if you can think of it that way and the way light falls on those objects, that's the way you want to light your figure. So if you've got light coming from the left or the right, take a look at the way light plays on a tube or a cylinder or a sphere and kind of treat your figure the same way. You're going to have the highest point of light at the top and the lowest point of light at the bottom. That's basically the way I think as I'm working around my figure. And if you think that way as you're doing it, you probably come out with some pretty good results as well. When you're adding highlights, or for that matter even shadows, I don't necessarily always highlight the entire piece of whatever it is I'm doing. I'll just do a portion of it, that way it kind of breaks the surface up and you don't get such a uniform look. And in my opinion, things just look a lot more natural that way. Like I stated previously, when the figure is starting to get to the point of completion, this is where I start being more precise with the placement of my shadows and highlights. This is where my highlights and shadows become a lot more intense, and it really helps to make the figure pop and stand out. Ugh, all right. Thank God we don't have to look at the ugly scarf anymore. With this second highlight, I'm just trying to pull things forward a little more and break them away from all the dark areas. So I'm not really painting out the entire area, I'm just kind of picking at things and observing and going back and forth and trying to see what works and what doesn't. And the third highlights you're just going in and kind of picking out areas again, hitting the brightest and highest points like around the collar and the lapel and the top of the pockets, all those kind of areas. I'm also using a stiffer blending brush here. I find that by using the stiffer blending brush in the final blending procedures, I can be a little more accurate with where I'm blending colors in and out of. This is sort of the final step, kind of beyond the final highlights. It just helps really bring everything forward f and separates the dark and the light a lot more. Especially if you're displaying this on a show table or outside your home, uh, it really helps to make the figure stand out. Speaking of display, don't forget to stick around right to the very end because I do have a nice little display of this figure in its completed form. So don't touch that dial. Painting the leather binocular straps was just a matter of painting 
lines vertically and horizontally and just getting the right highlights and shadows to create that kind of cracked worn leather look. As with anything make sure you've got some good reference photos handy to see what worn leather looks like or you know the surface of a coat that's always your best bet to create the most realistic effects that you can possibly create. And I think that's about all I have to say for this video. I'd like to thank you all for sticking around to the end. And I really do appreciate it, guys. So take care, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye now.